so good morning and thank you very much for coming at nine o'clock on a Sunday morning after such a great night last night. Um, we have a great panel this morning of people who are not journalists but um, whose work obviously crosses over a lot and from whom we have a lot to learn, I think. Um, one is still on his way, he's stuck in traffic. We, and one, in fact, has had to leave the conference early, so um, he has designated somebody. Ah, Dewa, good morning, welcome. Um, so, uh, on my immediate left is Malia Pulitzer, who is going to present the work of Jim Mintz, who's um, a private investigator and head something called the Mintz Group which, in New York, which does corporate investigations. To her right is Dewa Mavinga, who is the regional director in Southern Africa for Human Rights Watch. And to his right is Joe Davidson, who is a veteran, former FBI agent, um, has decades of experience in doing complicated, deep investigations. And uh, we will start with Joe to, um, to talk about how he does it and by the way, is now a private investigator and, in, and involved in training investigators in different parts of the world. Thank you, Bib. Thank you. Good morning. Um, yeah, I, I was asked to come and address to try to give a, a the difference between how we and the FBI, at least in my 30 years working, which was mostly organized crime cases, uh, use of undercover, and I, I understand uh, one of our speakers is going to be talking about that in an investigative, how do you, you employ that. Um, so I just want to uh, go over, obviously there's quite a bit of difference as far as um, the uh, assets that are available and maybe manpower, we're going to get into that. But I want to just start out, because this, it doesn't matter whether it's uh, a law enforcement investigation or it's a uh, journalist investigation. You gotta know your target. And what I mean by that is um, if, if you're just going off of uh, some other people's press report or you're going into it um, without any kind of uh, research, then you're gonna be uh, way behind when you dress, uh, when you get into actually questioning them. So you gotta really know your target. I'm gonna give you a couple examples. This used to be, an, uh, when I joined the FBI, this was the target that we used to shoot at and we have to qualify on. And if you notice along the sides, the arms, and along uh, the love handle sides, it's two points, three points, depending on um, where your round hits. What, what we found was when you shoot at the arm, and if you notice the arm on the left is a number two, because most people are right-handed, so you don't get as many points because that means he can still shoot, so you get an extra point if you hit uh, with the right hand, because most people are. Now, that doesn't go into play, right, if he's a left-hander, but the point is, this target now is, at the FBI is completely changed. The only uh, part of the target that we get points on scoring is that small bottle where you see the five and the ten and up to the head with the five. That's what our target looks like today, and the reason is because if you shoot any of the other wares, the person can keep going, can keep shooting, can keep causing harm. So we're not going to give you any credit, FBI agents, as you train, unless you can hit the target where it's going to be the most effective. Okay? Same thing when you go in an investigation. You want to go to the target. You don't want to be wasting your time um, uh, scurrying around uh, on the outside. So you really want to focus. Decide what your uh, investigation is supposed to lead to and then go with it. In the FBI, uh, we have um, obviously a lot of resources, but uh, we are under the gun as far as producing things, and we want to be uh, narrow so that we can use our manpower the best we can. Let's see. Okay, let's talk about some differences. Um, FBI agent atop. Here's uh, Shepard Smith, our, our Fox News reporter one of the few on this channel that I actually like. Um, but, you know, not much difference when you see him out there. And this is the way 
except when I uh, was undercover. I mean, this is the way pretty much he dressed every day. Uh, you would never know us other than a businessman or perhaps a, a, a news reporter um, like yourselves. Time. Usually in our investigation, there is no time constraint. Obviously, unless in exigent circumstances, kidnapping an imminent uh, terrorist, something like that, um, we're really focused and we are under the gun. But most of the time in our investigative um, effort, we, um, we have unlimited time. I've been involved in cases, that, uh, undercover cases that took three years. I mean, are your you know, uh, financiers, your, your editors, are they going to let you go if you tell them you're not going to be able to produce a story for three years? Probably not. But in our situation, we can go three years without producing any results as long as it's going directed. So that was a big difference. Resources. Obviously, we've got, um, uh, we've got the, the, the government's money, a lot more than uh, investigative reporters usually have. Um, the information. We have a huge database, as you can imagine. All the federal agencies, state agencies, we're able to draw from that. So we're going to be able to go quickly um, and, and target and get information. You're, you, you are searching for that information. Sometimes you're going to get it from somebody like myself. Um, tools. We obviously also have uh, various tools. I'm going to give you just a quick example. Uh, Mimi Shakarova, she uh, was a professor at uh, the uh, journalism school at Berkeley. She was doing an undercover assignment, not an undercover assignment, an, a documentary. It's called The Price of Sex. I don't know if any of you have seen it. It was a Daniel Pearl Award winner for Courage in Journalism. She went undercover, posed as a trafficked person, went to a brothel outside of Istanbul, was brought in by a former trafficker in there, and she posed as somebody that was being sold. She needed, wanted to record it and audio it, and so her editor uh, from the Bay Area News Group knew me from, I, I've done some work for the Graduate School of Journalism at Berkeley, and so he had known me from there. He asked me to consult with her on what, and I, my undercover, what kind of a device would be best to be brought in. The, I brought one of our tech agents to meet with her to explain here's a different uh, varieties. Unfortunately, uh, she was not allowed to buy the one that we, uh, we used because it was sophistication, but he did help her decide on how to do it. And if you watch the documentary Price of Sex, you'll see her video and uh, you'll get an idea of that. Um, the law. Okay, um, we have to concentrate on admissibility. So we're focused on gathering evidence that we're going to be able to introduce in court. In the investigative piece, you don't necessarily look into that. We have to go probable cause. I think, you, I think uh, investigative, I, I think the level would be reasonable suspicion. That's the way I would view the, the difference. Uh, the techniques, again, undercover. I, I understand um, you can do undercover, uh, but it's... It, it's frowned upon in a lot of your organizations. Some of, some of you don't. Um, also, the techniques. Um, Lo Bergman, who I uh, go in and I help at the, the graduate school at Berkeley, um, the first thing he does when he brings me in in front of the students, he says, he can do something that you're not allowed to do. He can lie. And that's the case. I can lie. I lied many, many times as an FBI agent. Not on the stand, but I lied many times when I was addressing my subjects or developing sources. We can do that. We can say we found your fingerprint on that gun or at the scene, even if we didn't. All right? If, if we elicit a response afterwards, oh, yeah, I was there, and then they find out later, so what? They may bring it up in court, but it doesn't, it doesn't fly. You ethically, at least that's what I've learned at the, the journalism school at Berkeley, are not allowed to do that. And I throw out to you, though, you can always pose the question, what if I told you they found what if I told you they found your fingerprint at the scene? You're not lying, right? Just a tip there. <laughs> um, forfeiture, big, well, let's go T3, that's Title III, wire, wire intercept. Um, obviously, you're not allowed to do that. We can, that's a huge tool for us. We use it very often. I, I've written uh, about a dozen F, uh, wiretap affidavits. It's very time consuming. You have to live within the four corners, so you have to be a good writer. And, un, uh, and in our system, FBI agents are the ones that write the affidavits, not the prosecutors. 
uh, forfeiture, that's a big bang. We can go up to somebody, if you're doing a report on the mafia boss, John Gotti, and you say, um, uh, I can go in and say, you know, unless you cooperate, unless you give me the, uh, everything, I'm going to take, when this case ends, you know you bought all this stuff illegally, we're going to seize all this stuff. But if you want to cooperate, maybe we could talk about, you know, maybe let you keep the home so your wife and kids could still stay in it, even though it was bought with, you know, blood money. But maybe we'll do that. And we have. You can't do that. That's another t t big difference. And um, the reputation, obviously, we all have uh, right now, who knows who has the worst reputation, our president, Congress, or the press, depending on who you talk to in the United States. The FBI, we pride ourselves. We've taken a lot of shots, a lot of hits, rightfully so, and some mistakes we have. But predominantly in the United States, if you, if you identify yourself as an FBI agent, you're already in the door in most places. Harder for you, I mean, because they're suspicious of uh, investigative reporters. They think you're going to do sensational journalism and not the really in-depth uh, investigations which we need. Yeah. Uh, and threats and deceits, I'm not, I only got two minutes, so I'm going to just move. Know your target. Um, Uh, the, I'm going to just talk real quick on trade shows. I helped uh, on a piece that's on the coroner's office that the um, Frontline did in, in, in uh, conjunction with ProPublica and I think NPR. And um, they were asking me, uh, one of the girls, said, hey, how can we get some information on the coroners? I suggested go to one of their conferences. Just go to the conference and go to the bar. You could go to our bar at the hotel and you could talk about the journalist talking about you know, stuff last night where I was, you know, at the Crown. Same thing, go to the conference, go to the bar, you'll get information. She did, she ended up applying, and got her Carter's license. It was, that was a part of the, the piece. Um, Justice for All, I want to, real quick, and I'm going to go over on this, but this is what I think is important. Um, in these in investigations, in the FBI, w this is a, a general rule of thumb, 10% of the FBI agents are the workers. They're the ones producing the cases. We call them case agents. That's the most important investigator you want to get to, if you can, in your investigation. Or in your respective countries, you've got to identify that. Then 80% of the agents are support. You know, they are they, they, um, doing the surveillance, they're on the wiretaps, they're helping you, they're doing the interviews and stuff like that. But they're not driving the case. And then 10%, they don't do anything. <laughs> um, <coughs> I just want to say, because I'm, I'm already out of town, time, uh, I became interested in investigative reporting because in the early 80s, a uh, uh, print reporter from the San Francisco uh, Examiner did a story that in my investigation on a drug dealing group. He did it really well. He had his details down, was fact checked. I thought it was good. He came into the court. This is very important how you can develop these law enforcement. Go to your courts identify who are those investigators, those guys that are always seem to be there. That's your 10%. Those are the people you want to try to meet. And um, he did such a good job, and he came into the courtroom, and I got to meet him. Well, a follow-up to that, I had an investigation on gambling, and he knew it was me, and he called me. And he said, now, this is completely against the rules. I wasn't supposed to talk to him. But because he had done a, such a good piece, I thought I could, you know, share some information that I thought was pretty much out there anyhow, and I did. And that's how our relationship going. And he did a really good story on that as well. Um, and he had individual information that I didn't know. When he ran that story, because I was getting blocked by FBI headquarters um, for a reason I can't get into, but I wanted some, to force it, so a news uh, story was gonna do it. He went ahead and he did the news story. Be prior to that, he came in to sit down with me and he said, hey look, this is what we have let me, uh, let me go over this. And I was going, yeah, oh yeah, yeah, we know this. I didn't know it. Okay, he was telling me stuff I had no idea. He had sources I didn't have. The next day when that paper came out, I went and I met my subject or the guy that I was trying to turn. I threw the paper down in front of him. I said, Tony, have you seen this? He said, yeah, where the hell did he get that shit? You know, and he just started going off and all that. I goes, well, look, if, you, if he's got this information, how much do you think I have? I'm the FBI. I didn't have any of that. <laughs> he flipped, he became my informant. So again, 
there is a little uh, quid pro quo there in that if you get a good story, we can take it and we can make informants and develop our case. Okay, I'm sorry I don't have enough time to really get into that. In the questions area, please ask me. My name, uh, here, um, I am a big proponent for the last 13 years. I've been working, I retired 13 years ago, with investigative stories all across the United States, some internationally. Here's my um, email, please. If you're in an investigation, you want to know uh, maybe how to approach a police officer or uh, what avenue you might want to take, please email me and I will get back to you, I promise you that. Okay, and with questions you can let me know. All right. Thanks, Joe. Just, uh, yeah, we're going to leave all the questions for after, um, so I'm sure you'll have many. Uh, I'm going to hand it over to Malia Pulitzer, who's, uh, for those who came in late, she's presenting the work of Jim Mintz, who unfortunately had to leave the conference early. Jim is uh, head of the Mintz Group, which is a private investigations group in New York. Um, and I believe the subject of, the of the, this presentation is finding former employees, former whatever, to do with your investigation. Hi. So uh, Jim was um, also a professor of ours uh, when I was at the investigative journalism program. And the thing that he, um, let me get to this. Basically, one of the things he really drilled into us is um, that looking for formers isn't just about former employees. You really have to have a former state of mind. So when you have the subject of an investigation, whether it's an individual or a company, you want to start thinking about everyone else who have some kind of overlap. So if it's an individual, um, not just former, uh, maybe former, former wives or husbands, um, maybe former neighbors, you can, you can talk to the real estate agents, just start really getting uh, around all of the different aspects of that person's life and looking for formers in every, every element. If it's a company, um, you can look for former vendors, distributors, and contractors. And so, of course, um, LinkedIn is one of the best places to look for formers when it comes to employees, but there are other places, too. Um, on Pacer, you can look for lawsuits against companies. Usually, if someone's suing the company, they're, they're no longer involved with it, or they shortly will not be. Um, there's a code 442, which is for employment. So if you see a lawsuit against a company, and there's the code 442 there, you're pretty sure that you've probably found a disgruntled former employee, and you can start your investigation by talking to them. Um, another way is if you go to the Wayback Machine, uh, oftentimes, it's harder to find on um, something like LinkedIn, uh, former board of directors. They won't necessarily be like list that they used to be the board of, on the board of directors or the director of a company. But if you look at the Wayback Machine on the former, um, bo on the board of directors page, you can see year by year what that used to be. And so that is another way that you can actually go back and see in the board of directors page, if those names change, you know that that's probably a form and you can try to, try to get in touch with them and look for them. So um, documents obviously are really important when you're trying to find formers. Um, some of the documents, uh, like for example, this, this um, at the bottom here is a document that is a, a commercial registry of Geneva. Um, it, again, it can be kind of hard to find former people on the board of directors that are really higher ups. So here you see that, that they actually, when they have um, people who have been replaced, they don't even remove it or white it out, they just cross out the name. So there are documents like this that you can find, and that's a really good way of finding kind of the higher ups that you might not easily, might not easily be available. When you want to start approaching formers, again, you should really think of them as kind of a community around, around the person. Think of it as like a ghost cloud surrounding the subject. And uh, he uses these visual charts that are really useful where each ring is kind of, the outer ring is the, the most distant people. Um, each ring you're getting closer and closer. So he'll actually create a chart with all of the different categories around, for example, an individual, like retail, like where, are they, where do they go to buy things? Um, real estate, like who are the real estate agents? Um, if they're gambling, where do they go? What are the, the casinos? Um, transportation, do they have limo drivers, former limo drivers, taxis? Do they use like a certain route all the time where people might be speaking to them, where they might buy their coffee? And so starting with the, the people who know them the least, uh, and they'll give, get you in touch with the people who, who might know him a little or her a little bit better. 
Uh, and so you, you start from, from out and you work your way in for each of these things. Um, yeah. So this is another type of data visualization that you can use. Um, for example, uh, this is when he was investigating a law firm. Um, the red are all of the former employees where he was able to chart out this is how long that they've been working, the gray ones are the people still working there. So let's say that you're trying to investigate an incident that happened, say, in 2004. If you set up your data, your data like this, you can actually just draw a line all the way down 2004, and all of the places where you see a red person, that, that's the person that you want to interview. So that's one way to kind of just organize the information so you know who to approach and how to uh, uh, approach them there. Um, so for example, this was a law, like I said, a law firm that he was investigating it was kind of like a Panama paper style law firm that was, he thought was doing some, some shifty things with taxes. And so he was able to then, by using this method, confirm um, what they were doing and, and kind of break the case. So as you start getting into the inner circles, the outer circles are the easiest people to talk to. Um, the inner circle people, as you get closer and closer in, people are going to be more hesitant to talk to you. So what he actually ends up doing is he'll um, always knock on doors and try to get to people in person. Um, knocking on doors, and spe especially residences, is a better place to get people to talk to you frankly. And he'll actually make this a chart like this, where he has kind of the information he's trying to get in question marks. It also shows what he already has. He'll actually print it out. And when he knocks on the door, he'll have it like this on his chest. So when <laughs> they open the door and they want to shut it in his face, he'll say, wait a second, you know, I understand if you don't want to talk to me, you don't have to give me any information, but maybe you can just help me a little bit. Like, this is a chart I made, and if you could just, just help me about, just tell me if it's right, just, just, just look at it. And what he finds is if he has something like this, first of all, people are really curious, right? Like, they want to look at the work he's done, and then they'll see he's done a lot of work, so they're going to feel a little bit less like they're giving the goods, and they might be inclined just to fill in one of these question marks. And it's also kind of like, like kind of charming, you know, it's kind of like a game. Like people want to see a list of, of a place where they used to work. It's kind of like gossip, and they're more inclined then to help you with it. So that's been an approach that's worked for him really well. Another, um, think of interviewing as kind of a journey through this community with sources that you develop, guiding you to better sources, and stay in touch. Like you don't just talk to a person one time. You might, after you've talked to them that first time, ask them, well, you know, do you mind if I just touch base with you as I'm doing this? And, um, you know, if I get something new, I'll just, I'll just, I'll keep you updated. I'll keep you updated on, on my investigation and what I'm doing. And, and maybe you can confirm if something seems fishy. Sometimes people don't give me good information. You can tell me just, you know, a little bit, tell me if you think that that's right or not. Um, and when it comes to the smallest guys, oftentimes he'll um, just email and phone call them. And, and use, but in a very strategic way. So not saying, you know, I am an investigator investing X, Y, Z, no, nothing cold. More like, he will introdu introduce himself, like I'm an investigator looking broadly into X, Y, and Z, but then he'll kind of put in like a little bit of a bait thing, saying, um, I have found some really interesting things. I've been talking to a lot of people, and if you just give me a call back, I'll tell you what I found, um, and I'll, I'll let you know exactly what I'm doing. And, and that kind of plants something that then they're interested in talking to him, and, and he finds that they often call him back. Um, he also, uh, in the very beginning with the outer circle, gives off the record like candy. Like everyone can be off the record because the point is, is he's trying to, to kind of paint a picture of the scenario of what it is he's actually investigating. And the more important thing is to get in the people who are implicated, right? So if, if people don't feel like, first of all, he'll also approach people and say, I've been talking to a number of people once that's the case. Um, so they don't feel like they're the whistleblower, they're the one who's gonna get in trouble. They can kind of hide in numbers. And, and he comes with information that he already has so they see that, that he's already been doing work, he's been doing this already, and they can add to that information without feeling like they're in danger. Um, so that's one strategy that he's, he's worked, uh, that's worked pretty well. Um, again, it's not just about one source, you need dozens and dozens and dozens. Um, a lot of journalists don't use this method because they get discouraged after calling maybe 10 people and everyone doesn't want to talk to them. It's not just about 10, it's, it's about dozens. For example, um, one of a, a former uh, student of his, who's now an investigative journalist, and used this method to try to get into a nuclear bunker. Um, obviously, when they approached the Defense Department, they said, no way are you getting into that. There's no way we'd ever let you do that. But then she called 200 former people who used to work there and got in touch with 80 of them talked to her. So out of 200, most of them said no, but 80 did, and gave her so much information of what happened underneath that bunker, then when she went back to the Defense Department and said, look, like, we know all of these things about what's, what's going on down there. 
and we're going to do this story. So we could do it in front of the fence with the video camera, me telling about all of these things that we know are more true, or you can give us a tour of it underneath and show us the good parts. And we'll still tell the story, but at least it'll be more, um, there'll be more information and you'll have uh, your chance to, to talk about the good things as well. And they did give her a tour, and it actually resulted in getting some more funding to improve some of the things in the bunker, and then they started giving her stories. Um, so um, another thing is a lot of formers will take hot documents with them, especially at companies where that are doing kind of shady things. They'll do this because uh, they need to protect themselves. And so it's something you should know. When you approach somebody about this, you should be careful about how you do it. Don't ask them, do you have a document and can you give it to me? They're going to say no. But if you know that these documents exist, you can start kind of slowly, like, I'm, do you know how I could get a hold of a document like this? Um, and as you build trust and you keep checking in with them and they get to know you better, um, and again, touching, in, touching base with them back and forth is really important as you're doing an investigation. You want to keep your sources warm, keep them kind of involved. Then somebody might, might give it to you. Another thing that almost everybody has when they leave is a phone directory. Um, that might even be a confidential document, but it's not actually confidential. People, when they leave, they want to stay in touch with their colleagues. And this is a way you can systematically find formers to interview and speak with. Okay. Um, okay, so uh, we're getting to the end now. And basically, uh, I mentioned before, um, most of the interviews are going to be off the record in the beginning until you get to, um, basically, you get to the people you really need to get on the record. So the higher-ups, current employees, those involved in wrongdoing. And at this point, by the time you get to them, you should already have a really good picture of, of what happened. You should have a really good sense of what it is. And so rather than being confrontational, take the information, you know, tell them the story, and show them that you already know everything anyway. So if you tell them, like, so this is what I know, this is what happened, and this is how it happened. And at that point, if, especially if they're guilty, what, what, what Jim has finds over and over again is they're going to be inclined, uh, since they already know you have everything anyway, to give kind of their defense, which is also confirmation. So at this point, no one is off the record, everyone is on the record, and this is how you get the ones at the top um, that you need to get in the first place. So, that's it. <laughs> Thanks a lot. For those of you who arrived late, um, we uh, will have questions after all three presenters. And the next one is Joa Mavinga, who is the Southern African Director of Human Rights Watch. Morning to you all. So, with uh, Human Rights Watch, uh, we work on Southern Africa. That's my focus in terms of research. Our methodology is to investigate, expose, and change. Uh, so, I'll focus on the investigative part where we try and get uh, information on human rights abuses um, uh, on whatever uh, case, be it uh, political violence, be it uh, child marriages, be it floods, and things like that. Our emphasis is to ensure that as Human Rights Watch, we retain uh, credibility and integrity, so we focus on accuracy in terms of uh, what we try and uh, get from uh, people uh, on the ground. And of course, the, this goes without saying that this is now in the, the era of fake news, uh, rumors, and one thing particularly strong about uh, people in Southern Africa is that they are good storytellers. So it is important to uh, try and sift through all that and get to the um, uh, uh, bottom of the matter. Uh, way before I joined Human Rights Watch, there was a case in Zimbabwe in 2002, uh, the Magunja beheading case, where a local uh, private daily reported that a woman had been beheaded by a husband in front of their children over a political issue. So now, for me, why this case is important is, is that there had been no attempt to verify. There was so much pressure 
uh, on the editors and everyone to say, let us get this thing out. Uh, at that point, I had offered uh, as an investigator in a civil society to say, is it possible to go out and uh, cross-check with others because there is a person who is telling this story, but we have not um, found corroborative evidence. But because of the pressure and the fear that if uh, this paper did not carry the story, someone would, 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 would carry the story the, the following day. Uh, the decision was to say, let's go ahead, let's print, because the place where this thing had allegedly happened was about uh, 400 kilometers from the capital. So they said, we simply do not have the resources or the time to wait uh, any longer than a weekend. And it, tem it turned out to be false. And this was a huge credibility dent for this uh, paper. Um, and for me, it became a big lesson that really always it's important to take your time. And another case more recently that, that has um, um, happened in Zimbabwe is the military coup case, where, as it happened in the early hours of Wednesday, there was a lot of information flying around in terms of um, what really was happening. I was in Harare as it was happening, and a lot of people were asking to say, can you verify, can you tell us what, what, what really is happening? Has the Army General been arrested? And because of that pressure, some were saying we should just you know, publish what we have. But again, uh, it, it, it became important to wait a bit, verify, and establish what exactly was happening. And at the end of the day, a number of uh, colleagues internationally were saying, uh, we now know that we have at least two credible sources in Harare, uh, yourself and one other person, because the others, you know, they're just forwarding what they get on WhatsApp, on social media, and it's, it's just difficult to understand. And um, I, I'm not a journalist by background. My background is law. So for me, I always try and push up the standard of proof to say, how do you say now you have a story? How do you move forward? And in that regard, is the, can your case that you're making stand up to scrutiny in a court of law? If it cannot, then you really need to uh, see if you can you know, go back and have more information cross-checked. Um, in that regard, again, I think it goes without saying that it's not about going with the gut feeling because uh, when we were talking about this Zimbabwe military coup case, people were saying, I feel it, I feel that really there must be something happening and therefore if it has been circulated, then I must, I must uh, publish it as fact because that's how I feel. Uh, it's, it's important to, uh, to resist the, that temptation and uh, the temptation to, uh, to outscoop the other journalists and, and, and rush before you have uh, established uh, all the information. Uh, also, another you know, sort of tip is that uh, anticipate in advance and address you know, rebuttal. Uh, think of the other side. You know, what, what could be a, a plausible rebuttal that could come and before you, you, you finalize so that you address it while you are you know, gathering your evidence? Uh, when I was in Mozambique and Malawi, you know, researching on Mozambican refugees that were flocking into Malawi, the southern parts, uh, my sense was that there could be a rebuttal from the Mozambican government that these were not refugees, these were not people fleeing you know, conflict. Uh, and indeed, it turned out that the government's view was that the, the, the refugees were farmers or traders who were crossing across the, a very porous border to Malawi uh, and then at some point going back. But because I had that kind of anticipation of the rebuttal, uh, I then in my investigations that to carefully gather information that could uh, prove that indeed these were refugees in flight and not you know, farmers or people going to shops in Malawi. And therefore, you had to look at if people were going shopping, they cannot you know, carry all their belongings. It cannot be the entire family of, of, of 5, 10, 15 people uh, and saying they cannot go back to Mozambique. So that then helped strengthen the case in terms of uh, what, what was happening. Uh, I also had a, a similar experience um, uh, when I was investigating uh, military killings in, in Zimbabwe, in the, east of, in the diamond fields of Marange. Uh, so there were many bodies that were piling up at, uh, at the morgues uh, in, in, in uh, the Mutare city. Uh, and the plausible rebuttal was that at that time there was a cholera outbreak. So I had to make sure that there is a clear distinction in terms of uh, proof that, yes, these were dead bodies, but they are not because of cholera. There must be something. So you then have to build a case by looking at uh, what evidence one can put forward that does show that, you know, 
is not uh, a cholera outbreak, but these are shootings by the military. So we have to look at um, uh, when uh, the, the MOG attendants offered to say, if you want to examine, to see the bodies, some of the bodies, then we'll let you then. I said, yes, because we wanted to see the wounds, you know, the, that are consistent with shooting, and, and then be able to say, this is uh, strong evidence that this could not have been um, uh, because of a cholera outbreak. Uh, if there are medical documents that are there, uh, if there are doctors we have examined, then you then uh, go uh, all the way to, uh, to look at that. Uh, we also had um, uh, a flooding in Zimbabwe of a, a dam in uh, Mashingo province. Uh, and the rebuttal from the government was that, well, this is a natural phenomenon. It's a flood. It happens all the time. But um, we had um, evidence that uh, it was actually uh, induced by the state because they had deliberately closed off the dam to, to, to push people off the, the, the place. Uh, but what was important to, was to get uh, that kind of um, evidence. So in, in, in terms of, um, in, in terms of um, getting evidence, it's always best to have documents, records that are there, uh, and uh, some other kinds of, uh, of, of proof, because people uh, would be, uh, would be, uh, would have different motives of saying things. You know, when you're dealing with people who have been traumatized, they could forget events, they could um, lump together events that are sometimes not related. They are not careful about, about uh, details like deaths, when exactly something happened. So when you're done, then investigating, you need to carefully go through that and cross-check and um, uh, have a story that, is, that can um, uh, stand up to scrutiny. So on the uh, dam flooding uh, in Zimbabwe, we also had to uh, resort to use of uh, sort of uh, satellite images to try and uh, prove the case that, you know, over a period of time, you know, the, the sudden flooding that was there and how uh, the, the dam had been uh, closed off that helped uh, us in terms of uh, presenting evidence that it was not just uh, uh, a natural disaster, but there were interventions that had been made uh, to uh, push and drive people off the, uh, the, the flood basin. And again, I, I think related to this idea that you know, there could be many reasons why you know, uh, people say uh, things, tell you, uh, you know, their stories. There is need always to uh, fact check, check all the claims that have been made uh, because sometimes um, uh, people have different expectations. Uh, if you are uh, an investigator, perhaps you have come a long way uh, from, say, a European capital and you are investigating, people might feel that, well, you could not have come all this way for nothing. I must give you a story to go back with. I must be nice to you and, uh, and give you a good story. Uh, so we always, there's always that kind of need to, uh, to, to check the, the claims that are, are made by, uh, by, by people sharing their stories with you. And also you need to uh, also keep going back to the reasons why people are talking to you, are telling you all these kinds of things. I have been in the field investigating issues to do with uh, you know, HIV AIDS, uh, access to, uh, to medication and food for, for widows uh, in Zimbabwe, uh, in South Africa. And sometimes uh, I would be in a group of, with, with a group of colleagues, some of them from Europe, and um, I, speaking in vernacular, my, some of the people would take me aside and say, so what is in it for us? Are we going to get something depending so that at least we know what to say? So this is also part of the reason why we you really need to uh, look at uh, the motivations. Uh, is the person a whistleblower? Are they, are they spreading misinformation? And wh what really is, is, is the background to it? Um, when, when engaging with government authorities, this is my final point, it's, it's important to try and put that at the tail end of your, of your trip uh, or of your, of your research work. Because sometimes, for security reasons, your, 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 your investigations could be stopped. Uh, sometimes it could also put uh, in jeopardy the security of those that you have spoken to. Uh, this is especially important in Southern Africa, where uh, the authorities are sometimes very, very um, intolerant and would not want information to come out. Thank you. Um, can I ask Malia and George just to come sit up here? I'm sure there's going to be two questions. Um, do we have anyone with a walking around with a mic? Um, I guess not. Uh, oh. Thank you. Um, are you going to walk around with a mic? Oh, great. Thank you. Uh, okay, so 
Let's see. Um, if we could take, say, two questions at a time and do it that way, and these two seem to be... Oh, I'm so sorry. Um, uh, okay, well, meanwhile, maybe we'll... Uh, we'd, okay, one and two. If you could pass this mic back, thank you, to Hello. Hi. Um, can I ask Mr. Davidson, um, what, <clears throat> when it comes to open source intelligence, uh, uh, what kind of uh, tools, I, I appreciate you have access to the things we don't, right? But in terms of accessing the things we do potentially have access to, I'm curious, what types of tools do you use? Do you have, do you do the same types of uh, open source checks that journalists might do, or do you have some specialized kinds of pieces of software or tools that you might use on that front? And your, also, yeah. could you um, maybe introduce yourself before you ask the question? Hi, I'm Yazid. I'm a journalist from Cape Town. I also have a question for, um, for Joe Davidson. Um, yeah, just coming to this um, question of ethics, which you said that, you know, um, agents may use unethical means to, ex to get information from people. Um, I'm curious to know then how that, how your relationship, how your relationship goes with journalists. And, and um, especially when it comes to this question of, of using ethical means to get information because we've had issues where it's criminal, for example, where we've, had, we've seen overseas cases rather where people hack into emails, tap phones, etc. cetera. Um, so I'd like to know how do journalists, what kind of work do you do with journalists? Was that a question for Joe yeah, Davidson? For Joe, yeah, Okay, so Joe, both of these are yours. Hand the mic to you. I'm going to have to ask you, uh, if you see me doing that, I was 20 years on the SWAT team. I got 70% hearing loss here and 40 here, so I, I didn't get all of yours. On the first question, um, no, we, uh, we have people, it's not myself, but I mean, we have analysts. They go through all the open source things. Every, I mean, you know, all these tools, if you've gone to any of these seminars already, and they say, okay, uh, this thing is $85 a year, this thing is 75 you know, the databases, the open source databases and the... Facebook, you know, all that stuff. We got all that, obviously, um, and we use all that. And then as, as far as the other sources, it's the, it's the stuff that, yeah. We, a lot of sources, um, toward the end of my career, uh, information I got, I could never use in a, in, a, in a court paper. You know, we could get information from the dark side, we call it, or the black hole, and it's for intelligence only or lead purposes, but we couldn't actually put it into a, you know, for a search warrant or, or use it in arrest. But the open sources are the same ones that you. Right. We have one unified database that will give you help, but like, I don't know. Like yeah. immigration. Great question. We're not allowed to have a universal database. The United States is against the law. The FBI's database cannot be merged with DEA or ATF. That's what, you know, 9 11 is a good example, JTTF. All these agencies, and they have it in Oakland, where I, I was supervised when I retired. The JTTF in San Francisco division is located um, in that. They have a floor in the office there. You have all the agencies. I think there's 42 different agencies, including local and state police. So um, DEA is there, uh, um, CIA, um, you, you name it, they're there. They're the ones that can access their own database. That's how that goes. But we're not allowed to keep a, a general database. It's against the law, yeah. What was the yeah relationship with your, my personal relationship or in general? I I still didn't hear it. I'm sorry. I, I'm just curious, can you please expand on your working relationship with journalists? You said you work with journalists on investigative stories. 
exp did it expand my relationship? No, can you tell us more about your working relationship with journalists? My working relationship, okay. Please, thank you. Okay, yeah, well, my working relationship was, uh, obviously, was never known by anybody <laughs> with the media. Uh, Dave Kaplan wrote a story in uh, 1998, U.S. News World. It was on one of my cases. That's how I first got to met him, meet him. I thought he did that really well. It was a cover story on that, on the looting of the uh, Russian treasury. Um, I thought it was real well done. Well... As a result of that, he called me on another matter on something else. I also knew he had written a book on the Yakuza, and I had worked some Yakuza stuff. So I respected him. I gave him information. I, got a, I would have been fired in a heartbeat, maybe even prosecuted a couple times, on, maybe. But, um, but for sure, I would have been fired. That relationship only developed because I do believe in the fifth estate. I do believe that stories need to get out there before the investigations get done. Because you can see right now with Mueller's investigation, it takes FBI... We're going to get there, but it's slow. But the stories, you know, it, it shouldn't preclude uh, a reasonable suspicious stories if it's done well to be out there and let, let it keep generating or else it's going to sit there and the case is going to dry up. So that relationship I had was personal for each of the, p the people that I ended up working with. Okay, and they, and they never ever re revealed me. Okay. Um, if we have uh, the, uh, the next question. If, if the m person with the mic could just wait till I kind of point to, because I can see sort of the whole room here. But that is the next question. So who else would like to ask a question? And you are the one after that. Um, I actually, uh, hi, I'm Mal Herbe from Netwerk 24 in Cape Town. Um, I actually have the same type of question for Joe uh, that Nazir had. And it was more with regards, to especially because you have that danger of being fired for being you know, connected to journalists or to their stories. I was wondering if you had steps that you took to maybe disguise yourself or to, uh, you know, uh, erase your tracks so th that you couldn't be connected to stories or to journalists. And the second question. Uh, I have, um, hi, my name is Bo Young. I'm from News Tapa, South Korea. I have um, one question each for um, the men's group. I, sorry, I've didn't hear your name earlier, and Dewa. Um, my first question for Mintz is, um, how long do your investigations take in terms of like contacting all those formers? And for Dewa, my question is, um, you said that you have to question the source, their motivations to giving you information. Have you had any cases where the sources um, gave you misinformation or disinformation? Thank you. Okay, um, just in, ans in asking a question, just since we're running a little short of time and I think there's a lot of questions here, we could just keep the questions real short and the answers as short as possible. So um, I'm gonna hand first to um, Malia to, deal, to answer the second question and we'll work our way backwards. Um, <clears throat> so I actually don't work at the Mintz Group, um, so I can't answer as to how long his do, but from journalists I know who've used this approach, it could be, um, it could be a few months. Uh, it could be, it just depends on how, how much information you're trying to get, how many people you end up having to contact. So it just depends on how lucky you get going in. It usually at least takes like a few, a few, a few months, probably. Um, in terms of misinformation, that's where like the more people you talk to and why you keep checking back with sources, right? Because if you have a sense that something might be fishy, oh, sorry, yeah. sorry. Yeah. Okay, thank, thank you. On, on uh, misinformation, uh, it happens all the time. Uh, people give us uh, in accurate details all the time for different reasons though. Sometimes it's because they actually want to mislead and have a particular angle come out in this story. Uh, sometimes it's because they think they might get something. Uh, so for example, if you are dealing with political violence, uh, people might give you stories that could actually be you know, a case for political asylum in another country. So they'll be building a case and hoping that if, you, if it is published, then it means that they then can be accepted in, in another space. So you need to be very careful about you know, what information you get, how you cross-check, you corroborate, and then at the end of the day, you then get you know, what you can use if it is not uh, with corroboration, don't use it. Thank you. And I think the final question for Joe is um, how to hide your tracks. No, it's, uh, you asked me about disguising myself. Or any, no, I never, I never worried about that. I used to meet him for coffee and things like that. I, I will say, though, on, uh, because um, 
San Francisco Bay Area is a, a big uh, area. And in addition to that, the FBI has two houses. FCI, Foreign Counterintelligence, Criminal. I never worked that left side. That's a whole different ball game. I would have probably done maybe that if that was what I was reporting on. One of the criminal stuff, I never had an, an issue. Okay, next two questions. Whoa. <laughs> uh, no questions? Ah. Um, I just have one quick one for Malia uh, with regards to, um, for example, the graph that you showed. Can you just um, elaborate a little bit on the kind of tools that you guys use in mapping out and uh, you know, putting things together? And then also, it's actually for anyone on the uh, panel, but when you get, for example, documents um, from a source or whatever, and you have a couple of questions about their motives and so on, um, can you just elaborate on your process in terms of verifying those documents? Uh, I understand if it's a very long document, there's probably a couple of people that you can speak to, but um, have there been cases where it's you know, extremely technical or difficult to actually verify whether the documents that the sources have you know, given you are valid and you know, credible. Thanks. So the first one for Malia, who's uh, sitting in for Jim Mintz, um, about the mapping graph. Uh, yeah, so you mean the circle one? Okay, so the circle one basically is just a way to kind of drive the investigation. So let's say that there's an individual that you're trying to investigate. So each of those different colors were kind of just different categories of people that the, that you know are kind of close to that individual in different ways. So one might be like in the employment, right? Wh who, who he's working with or used to work with or what have you. Another might be like family members, distant family members, former family members, the wives of, of in-laws, et cetera, right? Then you might have one with um, how do they get around, like taxi drivers, um, limo drivers, former limo drivers. Do they take a certain like way to get to work every day? Are the people they always buy their coffee from? Like that kind of thing. Um, and so basically just charting all of the different parts, like do they have a gambling problem? If they have a gambling problem, where do they gamble? Um, what, what, I mean, all of those different aspects. So you have those in all the colors, and then the different rings are basically the people on the outside are the people it's easiest to talk to, and he actually will even write down the names of the people. So it's also to help guide his, his um, well, or rather guide the investigation, right? Because you don't want to go too far and too quick. Right? You want to start on the outside, get as much information as you can, and then as you go move further in to the closer people, once you have that information, it's much easier to talk to them because then you have a strategy and an approach of, of how to get to them. And so also like each person that you talk to in each ring will give you more people who's in the closer ring in that same category, but sometimes in other categories as well. So it's really just a data visualization to help map the investigation itself. That's not necessarily one of the ones that you would present a source with, although maybe, maybe you could, depending on your strategy. Um, and then the other one, the timeline one, was more um, if you're looking at a specific company and you're trying to find out what's happening at a specific time, if you just have that list of people where you have, like, the red was for all of the former employees, the gray was for the current employees, and, and the line was basically, you knew they were working there from like 1997 to 2004 or what have you, right? So then you can just, when you have the dates, just look and see who overlaps the date that, that the event you're trying to understand happened at, and it's just an easier way to know like who's been there, how long, and who might have what levels of information. Um, the other question about how do you verify documents. Um, uh, Joe, do you want to take that one? Well, I mean, it, from the, the FBI standard is, uh, in order for it to be admitted into court, we have to, whoever produced it, you know, we'd have to have a statement for whoever produced it, or we have to have some other cooperation that, you know, it was some kind of internal document, and, and this is the way it was produced, and it, you know, it came off the mainframe or whatever, so that somebody didn't just make one up and, you know, Xerox it and uh, copy it and then reinsert it. So uh, it, it, you got to have one of the authors of the document or uh, a banking institution or some other method. Good morning. My name is Krina Boros. I live in London. I'm a freelance journalist in London. Um, I was wondering whether you use source mapping software, and if so, what do you use? Sorry, can you, can you like tilt the mic just a little bit up so we can Is hear you properly? Right? Is this all right? Yeah, you just tilt it a little horizontally. Like this, okay. 
Yeah, I, I was wondering whether you use any source mapping uh, software, and if so, what do you use to show connections between different people, or organizations and people? Is this for a particular panelist? Oh, thank you. Who? Um, I mean, I, I can't speak for, for Mint's group, but I, I've used Muckety, which is quite good. Um, that's something that, that you can help, it helps you connect sources. That's very useful. Uh, not, not for me, thank you. <laughs> I've been retired 13 years. I couldn't tell you the name of any uh, mapping software, but we use it. But obviously, the case agent won't be the one doing it. It'll be one of the 80% that know that, know that. I wasn't one of them, so. Um, any other questions? Uh, there's one way at the back there. Um, hi, Toby McIntosh with GIGN. There have been a few Can you just hold the mic? Oh, like yeah, the mic thing, be. right. Um, there have been a few examples of people using social media to advertise for former employees. Um, I wonder if somebody would comment on that. And secondly, um, is there any advantage in getting, it's completely different, but can you, are there any advantages in journalists getting private investigators licenses to um, access more things? Um, well, that's an interesting ethical question as well. Can journalists get pri private in investigator licenses? Um, uh, Joe, could you, Talk about that piece of it, and um, the other, uh, and maybe one of the other panelists would like to discuss social media, which we haven't really touched on as a source of documents, information, formers. Yes, investigative journalists can become private eyes, and private eyes can become investigative journalists. So, in the United States, I don't know, you know, in some countries, you're not allowed to be. No private investigators. I was in Serbia for five years. There's no, not allowed. I've been, I've been in Algeria now for the last six, six, seven years. They're not allowed to have private investigators in those countries. So, but in the United States, private investigators, you can be an investigative journalist uh, and be a private investigator too. Um, I think for social media, uh, LinkedIn is definitely the most useful resource because people have their CVs there and you can just search by company and see who has um, been working for what company, whether they're there presently or in the past. Um, I've also in the past also used Facebook um, because sometimes it'll, it'll be in the Facebook if you press the company, again, people who have that, um, if people have linked former, former affiliations. Um, yeah, those are the two that I, I personally have used. I'm sure there are other resources, but those are the ones that I, I have experience with. Let me just add one thing as far as developing source. As far as law enforcement, that's a good way to get uh, current law enforcement that are sympathetic and want the truth out. That's all, that's all I'm talking about, is getting the truth out. Um, you find in former retired FBI agents like myself who may be able to tell you, you know, especially when they first retire, I'm way out now, but you know what, I, I, know, I know a guy that he's, I know what he's doing and I know he, he's probably approachable. So that, that's the way for you as a reporter, if you can't get into the, 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 the current investigation that way, uh, try somebody that has just recently retired. Um, Joe, I just, I just have one like, follow-up question. Do you mean that like current invest uh, journalists, you're a working journalist, you can get a private investigator's license? What would that give us access to? I, I, don't, I don't know if it really gives you access in the United States to anything more than anybody else can. I, there are some uh, maybe gun carrying abilities and things like that, but as far as uh, ability to... License plate databases. No, well, databases. no you're, not, you're not supposed to be able to get in license plate databases, but, um, but there are some um, that you can you go through. But in California, it's called CLETS and uh, no one can access CLETS directly, but there's other databases that have collected things that you can play around with. But no, that was, that was when I first, you know, when I, guys retired from the office, that was the first thing they do is they call back to, 
uh, my first office was San Diego, you know, on one of my training agents, but he retired, and the first thing, he got a PI firm. Guys would call, hey, can you run this plate? You run this plate, you run this plate, and, you know, it's against the law to do it, but guys did it. But, uh, yeah, no, that's a no-no. <laughs> Um, question right here. Oh, and could you also introduce yourself, if you could? My name's Cecil Rosner. I'm from Canada. Um, I was actually just going to ask a question about that. In terms of what can you do as a private, I, in some jurisdictions, I know in Canada, it allows you to use a pretext, legally. It allows you to legally use a pretext, okay? But if, if you're a journalist at the same time, then there's an ethical issue there. But in some jurisdictions in Canada, it allows you to call somebody and say, hey, I'm the landlord of so-and-so, can you, can, you can you run this check for me? And, and there's legal protection to do that in answer to that question. I was going to ask that very thing. Sometimes journalists have sources and who can run, can you tell me the criminal record of this person? Can you get me a mugshot of this person? But does that really, maybe you've been, I, I don't know if, what your current knowledge is, but can any of that really exist anymore? Because I imagine it all gets recorded pretty carefully now, does that world still really exist? Where if you have a, a friend or a source, you can actually get some access to things. Um, first of all, as far as the, the ethic, it's the ethical dilemma. Yeah, if you're a private investigator and you're a journalist at the same time, as a private investigator, you can lie as you're going out there doing it in private. I mean, it's not against a lot of lie, but uh, your ethical responsibility as an investigative journalist, I believe, at least at the graduate school at uh, Berkeley, and it, that's the rule there, and I believe it is. Um, but as far as, uh, yeah, it's, um, you used to be open terminals, you know, everybody could do, I could walk in and sit there and you just, you know, would type in um, the name, um, especially police departments. The FBI uh, cracked that about eight, 1981. We all had a, when we got on a terminal, run a license plate. So there's always a trackability. Um, yeah, so it's harder to do nowadays. So um, there are ways to get around that. Um, you know, uh, sometimes plates come up in investigations and they're on long lists. You add a couple plates to it and it's pretty hard to t determine that those two plates, who's to say you didn't see that plate? See what I mean? There are ways to get around it. You gotta put your... <laughs> we have five minutes left on the clock, unless people want to stay longer. Um, and uh, any more questions? If there are no more questions from the audience, maybe um, would any of you three panelists like to just sum up with some sort of thoughts you didn't have a chance to say or that f uh, follow some of the questions? Um, the family, the family thing. Um, when you're when you're out there looking for sources, when you get a target, you got to really make sure you research the family of the subject because a, a lot of times that's where you're going to get your sources. Two of my best sources were ex-wives um, from uh, my subjects. They became uh, very efficient, and um, uh, one of them, she's coming. Uh, she's already made the book, um, uh, something against all odds. But uh, Margot Robbie's going to play it in a movie, and you know she completely got me all wrong on there. She was a very, very good source against her uh, former husband. Um, of course, in the book, she takes it a different way, but I, I, uh, that was, I was always identify the family, no matter who it was, because a lot of them, uh, they were very disappointed in the choice of their son, daughter, husband, wife, uh, you know, grandkid. Uh, so, uh, you know, they want to get them straight. They hope the FBI can set them straight, and I was there to try to help that. So. I uh, always remember the families. Um, and I, the reason why I have this slide, notice this, if you're looking for sources, um, uh, see right here and right here. So FBI, you don't have a source in the FBI. If you see, if you've got a news report on an incident like that, here's FBI uh, state task force, that's the state police. Here's the U.S. Postal Inspectors. Sometimes these other agencies, because the FBI gets all the press and stuff, and they, and they want to you know, get a little bit of their own, they're a little bit open, more open, might be uh, better approachable for you, uh, as opposed to hitting the agency right on the head, the FBI. 
So uh, keep that in consideration too. Thanks a lot, Doa and Malia. Some last thoughts? Everyone's talked out. I think everyone's recovering from last night. Thanks so much for coming to this uh, session.